Um, hi everyone, I am Simone. I am a second year student here in the MA program. Um, I'm here to introduce Jamila, who we're very excited to have here tonight for a Roski talk. Um, in our art and curatorial <coughs> visits class this past, actually last year, um, the second year MA students met with Jamila at the Mark Bradford Scorched Earth show at the Hammer and had an insightful tour and Q&A discussion with her. We also had a chance to visit the Enjadeka Akumili Crosby and Akosua Adoma Olosu shows she curated at um, Art and Practice, the Hammer's affiliate space in the Merck Park. Um, in her capacity as an assistant curator at the Hammer, Jamila also worked, excuse me, also organized the group exhibition, A Shape That Stands Up, a solo show of work by Alex DeCourt and various other shows both at the Hammer and at Art and Practice. Her Hammer Project's Simone Lay show just co closed earlier this month. Previously, Jamila has held curatorial positions at the Studio Museum in Harlem and at the Queens Museum in New York where she co-organized the 2010 <coughs> Queens International Biennial. In addition to her work within the field of visual art, Jamila comes from a music background and her first exhibition centered around homemade instruments and sound. She's also interested in and influenced by the world of film theory and pop culture. <coughs> Jamila has spoken about using her position as a curator to be a platform for advocacy and activism. She has also spoken about her practice as a way to think about a question or problem she'd like to answer and bring works or artists to the table that help her arrive at solutions. Solutions. Tonight's question, as we all know, is really delightful. What is a curator good for? <laughs> um, the big news about Jamila is that she was recently appointed curator at ICA LA downtown, formerly the Santa Monica Museum. We're very excited to see the programming she brings to this new space and to hear her speak to us tonight. Again, please join me in welcoming her. Okay, great, yes. <laughs> this is fine, this works well. Um, I want to say thank you to Nora and Amelia and Nal for inviting me to come talk and also to Simone for that lovely and thorough introduction. Mm -hmm. Nothing embarrassing came out of that, so I'm happy. <laughs> Hi, Norm. And I guess I'll just launch right into this talk uh, that I've been delivering in um, a couple different, vari I've delivered a couple variations of this talk um, over the last few months, but not since November. Uh, it's fair to say that a number of us have been navigating this question about what is the purpose of what we do as cultural practitioners, especially in this moment in American and world history. To that I say, well, what was the purpose of this work before November 8th, 2016? Making, studying, exhibiting, or writing about art just got all the more critical and important to the foundations of culture and society because our voices, when joined, are strong and have power, and we must not lose sight of that, even with more and more depressing news daily. I have been thinking about the ways in which curating can be activated as a form of advocacy or activism. The thing I've been good at so far in about 12 years of curating, both independently and institutionally, is identifying artists whose practices have significant intellectual or cultural merit. I tend to gravitate towards artists who haven't necessarily received a fair shake in this industry. That is women, artists of color, queer identified artists, and the self-taught. I'm not particularly interested in beauty or art for art's sake. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the personal is political as they say, and by extension, I believe the practice of making and interpreting art must be as well. Recently, hundreds of thousands have taken to the streets in protests of the current administration. The motivations to get into the streets vary from person to person, but artists have especially taken this opportunity to galvanize in the name of activism. We're especially creative with signage and messaging, though it is a learning curve. I think about ACT UP or AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and there are many, many important actions in the name of people living with AIDS and those who didn't survive the height of the epidemic. 
I think about the performance of protests, the impact of the visual, and the collective raising of voices. I wonder how the 80s would have played out differently had it not been for groups like ACT UP or Grand Fury, who collaborated with the former on their visuals. Um, I think about the recent movements like Dear Ivanka, an appeal to the first daughter, and the J20 art strike. The closing of museums and galleries for the day was, for me, a little troubling. I thought museums should be free all that day and to provide a platform for people to, pro to process, discuss, and listen. Since galleries are in the business of commercial exchange, the proposition of them ceasing operations for the day and slowing the flow of money to and from the market would have been an interesting gesture. I like to go back to the artist activism of the 1980s rather than that of the 1960s because this is of my lifetime. I was born in 1980. Um, you can do the math and figure out how old I am. Uh, the two groups that I like to discuss uh, time and again are because they use curatorial practice um, as part of their activism is CoLab, known as Collaborative Projects and Group Material. From 19 se November 1978, different artist members of um, CoLab organized and installed original one-off shows in their studios or other temporary sites, such as the Batman Show at 591 Broadway, the Income and Wealth Show at 5 Bleecker Street, this is all in New York, the Manifesto Show also at 5 Bleecker Street, and Just Another Asshole Show also at 5 Bleecker Street. Members of CoLab included the filmmaker Charlie Ahern, who is known for his film Wild Style, Liza Bier, who is the publisher of Avalanche Magazine with Willoughby Sharp, artist Jenny Holzer, Judy Rifka, Kiki Smith, Tom Otterness, and art critic Walter Robinson, among others. CoLab organized a number of group exhibitions at temporary sites that brought social discourse into the equation. They are maybe best known for their 1980 exhibitions, The Times Square Show and The Real Estate Show. The Times Square Show featured artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat, Jack Smith, and Keith Haring, while the Real Estate Show um, had many more and addressed development and landlord speculation in New York. The show was eventually closed by the police until it relocated to what is now known as the cooperative ABC No Rio. CoLab's mission, and this is a floor plan for the uh, real estate show, no, Times Square show. Uh, CoLab's mission reads as follows. We collaborative projects are func functioning as a group of artists with complementary resources and skills providing a solid ground for collaborative work directed to the needs of the community at large. Specifically, we are involved in programs facilitating development, production, and distribution of collaborative works. These works are realized in various media, including film and video for distribution and cable cast and live cable television broadcasts, as well as other more conventional art media, such as graphics and printed materials. The statement, this statement defines three fundamental aspects of CoLab. Members desire to create and distribute collaborative work under the umbrella of an artist-run organization, their focus on new media versus traditional art objects, and their openness to a range of aesthetic styles that would meet the, quote, needs of the community at large. This last point was critical to the group's identity and served as the foundation of a workshop-oriented administration that encouraged experimentation in many different areas. CoLab would produce many projects without the burden of an institutional identity. Typically, individual members work together on more than one project in small subgroups. Similarly, group material organized exhibitions and programs that centered community and social activism. Group material included the artist and historian Julie Alt, Doug Ashford, Tim Rollins, known for Tim Rollins and the Kids of Survival, and the late Felix Gonzalez Torres, among others, and employed, quote, employed a remarkable range of curatorial strategies working collectively, politically, and in relation to specific cultural situations. Their 1981 exhibition, The People's Choice, uh, also known as Arroz con Mango, was staged in a rented storefront and assembled from personal belongings of collections from people neighboring the space, which was at the time the predominantly Latino Lower East Side in New York. They used bus and subway posters, billboards, newspaper inserts, and shopping bags as ways of getting their messaging out. After the election of Bush 1 in 1988, they created a four-part exhibition called Democracy for the Dia Art Foundation, which addressed AIDS, election politics, education, and cultural participation. This is, a, is as relevant today as it was almost 30 years ago and could stand some revisiting. Not that I'm looking to sign up for more projects to do. <laughs> 
There are also a number of groups that have used programming as a way of approaching a more just world, like the Bruce High Quality Foundation in New York, who pivoted from being a collective artist group making work to making their work be the work of arts administration and pedagogy. They offer classes and workshops free of charge and describe this project known as the Bruce High Quality Foundation University as, quote, a learning experiment where artists work together to manifest creative, productive, resistant, useless, and demanding interactions between art and the world. The classes are free as a necessary tactic towards a greater strategy of freedom. They believe that a great, that greater artistic freedom is the result of the active pursuit of crisis, of bringing ideas to the breaking point through the cultivation of difference. Then there's also local and kind of local artists, Theaster Gates, Mark Bradford, and Rick Lowe, who have founded their own organizations, Rebuild Foundation and Dorchester Projects in Chicago, Art and Practice here in Los Angeles, and Project Row Houses in Houston as a way to support, to support a space and a community simultaneously. As you may know, I worked as the assistant curator at the Hammer in Westwood for two years, where I focused primarily on organizing exhibitions and programs at Art and Practice through the museum's public engagement department. The two-year collaboration resulted in seven exhibitions and several public programs that dovetailed with the social services geared towards transitional aged foster youth, that is people ages 16 through 21 who are aging out of the foster care system, also housed at Art and Practice. The Art and Practice campus is situated in Lemert Park, considered to be the center of Black Los Angeles, where a number of important venues called home, such as the legendary Brockman Gallery, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, the World Stage Music Center, and Esawam Books, a Black-run bookstore. One of the focuses of our program at Art and Practice was to platform arts of the African diaspora, primarily local African-American artists, but I did invite a number of national artists to AMP, including filmmaker Colleen Smith, who currently has work on view at UC Riverside, sculptor and sound artist Kevin Beasley, who also has ex an exhibition up right now at the Hammer, and the New York-based artist Jenny C. Jones, who is the recipient of the Robert Rauschenberg Award last year. Now is the part of the presentation where I begin to run through the exhibitions I've worked on in the last few years to illustrate my orientation as a curator and the work I tend to gravitate towards and support. Before coming to Los Angeles, I worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which is a well-celebrated institution focused on art um, by, made by or inspired by black culture. The museum has been open since 1968 and is noted for its residency program on which it was founded, which includes among its participants a number of notable artists, including David Hammonds, Julie Moretu, Leslie Hewitt, Wangechi Mutu, Nari Ward, and Kahindi Wiley, among others. One of the main projects I worked on while I was a curatorial fellow there was supporting Naima Keith, who's now the deputy director of the California African American Museum. I think she came and spoke a couple of weeks ago. That's my girl. Um, was when she was an assistant curator first and then an associate curator at the Studio Museum. And it was working on the research for the exhibition and catalog, Charles Green's grid work. 1974 to 1989. I um, got the nickname Art Detective uh, based on my nascent research skills. Uh, Charles Gaines, of course, is a storied figure in the Los Angeles art scene, known both as a formidable conceptualist and a pedagogue at CalArts. Charles enjoyed a lot of great and critical, great critical attention in New York in the early 80s and the late 70s and was included in the 1975 Whitney Biennial, curated by Marsha Tucker, founder of the New Museum in New York and patron saint of young curators everywhere, and was represented by the blue chip gallery Leo Castelli, but was not, for whatever reason, embraced by the Studio Museum until the 2009 group exhibition, 30 Seconds Off of an Inch. The focus of the exhibition was on Charles's earlier work completed while he was living in Fresno and teaching, which were inspired in part by the drawing heavy and mathematically informed practices of Hannah Darbavin, Sol LeWitt, who was a close friend and colleague of Charles's, and the early conceptual photography experiments of Douglas Hubler. At this moment in the 1970s, conceptual work wasn't necessarily a curatorial priority for the Studio Museum, particularly coming on the heels of the civil rights movement. Naima's dedication to Charles resulted in a remarkable exhibition that reinserted a significant artist who was working in abstraction into the history of an institution with whom he hadn't previously worked. The exhibition eventually traveled to the Hammer where Ann Elgood, the senior curator, and I were the receiving curators. 
And we added a few additional works, such as a series from 1984 called Assorted Trees with Regression, which hadn't been seen since the early 90s. Simultaneously with the exhibition at the Hammer was another exhibition of more recent work by Charles entitled Librettos, Manuel de Falla, Stokely Carmichael at Art and Practice. Librettos was a continuation of recent works by Charles, um, such as Manifestos 1 from 2008, Manifestos 2 from 2013, and the series Notes on Social Justice that combined musical notation and political rhetoric to explore the role of language and systems in establishing meaning. The work took as its foundation an early 20th century opera called La Vida Breve, or Life is Short, by Spanish composer Manuel de Falla. And it combined it with a 1964 speech by Stokely Carmichael of the Black Panthers Party as a libretto, highlighting the intersection of racial and economic struggle. The exhibition that followed was an archival presentation of the Brockman Gallery and Productions Archive. I didn't mean to say archive twice. Uh, spearheaded by the artist and educator Dale Davis uh, while he was in residence at Art and Practice, the Brockman Archive was, um, the project was the process of preserving more than 20 years worth of ephemera, publications, correspondence, and records from the Brockman Gallery, which was housed at 4339 Degnan Boulevard, a storefront now occupied by Art and Practice between 1967 and 1989. The gallery, and this is an installation view of the show, the gallery worked with and exhibited many important Los Angeles and national artists early in their careers, such as Betty Saar, Noah Purifoy, John Outerbridge, and David Hammonds, among many others. Alonzo Davis, um, Dale's brother, and Dale also organized public programs, including an annual film festival and concerts, and they curated exhibitions or served as advisors to galleries and institutions such as LACMA and the Studio Museum. Lending support to predominantly African-American visual artists at a time when they weren't major, there wasn't major visibility or opportunities for these artists, the Brockman Gallery played a significant role in supporting and documenting the, con the contributions of black artists in Los Angeles and beyond the city. In June 2015, the Hammer mounted the exhibition Scorched Earth, which was the artist Mark Bradford's first solo exhibition in Los solo museum exhibition in Los Angeles. The exhibition was curated by Connie Butler, whom I assisted, and was accompanied by a reader featuring reprints of essays by Jose Esteban Munoz, Marlon Riggs, and an illustrated chronology that I wrote. The exhibition included a suite of 15 new paintings by Bradford, including this site-specific painting on the museum's lobby wall. The coloration of this was the result of Mark excavating through layers of paint from previous Hammer projects and installations, which I think at that point, there have been about 100 site-specific projects on this wall. The work was called Finding Barry, a tongue-in-cheek reference to the artist Barry McGee, who was the second Hammer project to grace that wall. The work, uh, visibly a map of the United States, uses outdated statistics from 1996 um, which it was a count of the number of people living with AIDS per capita in each American state. With this exhibition, Mark wanted to highlight the different modalities of abstraction, be it of information, an image, or one's personal identity. The illustrated chronology that I prepared for the book, the research for which resulted in many hours spent at the One Archives here at USC, was a timeline of queer and black activism in Los Angeles and how those gave way to AIDS activism in the 1980s. The centerpiece of the paint, the centerpiece for the show or of this gallery of paintings was the large one that's in the center, which was called I Can't Force the Bathhouses to Post Anything, which refers to the hysteria inside and outside queer social spaces around the transmission of AIDS in its early years. Included in the exhibition was my favorite Part, which was the video Spider-Man, which was a stand-up routine performed by Mark, who, as a gay bla black man, was inhabiting kind of the personas of black American comics like Moms Mabley, Blowfly, and especially Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy made a film in 1983, a concert film called Delirious, uh, which served as a major point of departure for Mark. The film was widely criticized for its homophobic content and misinformation. By inhabiting the space of the stand-up comedian and performing machismo and bravura, bravura, 
Bravara. Never mind. <laughs> and a nightclub. I say it right sometimes, and then I can't say it right sometimes. Anyway, uh, Mark was able to reclaim and transform the embarrassment of Murphy's ill-advised commentary into something politically active and alive. The next several exhibitions I worked on for Art and Practice, or The Hammer, um, considered the ways in which the issues of representation can manifest itself. I organized two exhibitions of the Nigerian painter Njideka Akinyili Crosby, known for her deft use of collage and portraiture as a way of discussing her experiences as an immigrant and expat living in the, in the United States, as well as foregrounding for American audiences the jubilant cosmopolitanism of Nigeria today, rather than the bleak images of the African continent that tend to thrive in the American imagination. A Shape That Stands Up was the first group exhibition that was organized for art and practice, which included 15 artists from um, various backgrounds, and it was a multi-generational show that examined the gray space between figuration and abstraction in recent painting, drawing, and sculpture. <coughs> the artists whose work was in, on, was in the exhibition treated the figure as material and the history of representation as one long, open-ended question with many possible answers. The varied artworks that, result, that, re, that resulted in the prompt consideration of what an individual's subjectivity may bring to the discussion and practice of abstraction, and what motivates artists to decenter the figure's historical dominance in the visual field. While the exhibition concentrated specifically on works produced after 2000, it sought to trace a historical lineage of artists and exhibitions that have questioned the role of portraiture and figure painting in art history, in the ways in which the body's representation becomes a field for projection, interpretation, and contestation. The exhibition was influenced in part by the controversial 1978 exhibition, Bad Painting, also curated by Marcia Tucker. It reckoned with what Tucker called figurative distortion and its manifestations in 21st century art. In painting and drawing, breaking apart the figure and reducing it to a barely legible state is a modernist impulse born out of a preoccupation with otherness, be it cultural, physical, or psychological, which still informs a lot of artistic and cultural production today. Humor played a big role in this exhibition, as it is one of my favorite strategies for addressing difficult questions, as the question of rep representation often is. The bodiness of some of the imagery, like Carol Dunham's drawings or Juli Jamie and Giuliano Villani's orange carrying its own flesh, served as a vehicle to challenge a viewer's orientation towards their own sense of self and how that may appear to others in the world. The last exhibition I organized for art and practice was the solo debut of Philadelphia-based installation artist Alex de Corte. The exhibition was a presentation of four videos within an installation that continue his investigation of Arthur Rimbaud's A Season in Hell from 1873 which recounts the author's imagined descent into purgatory and his struggles with spiritual and emotional, <coughs> emotional turmoil. Rimbaud wrote the poem shortly after ending his tumultuous affair with fellow symbolist poet Paul Verlaine. Replete with dense imagery and linguistic flourishes, yet scathing in its allegorical depiction of romance and decline, the text can be taken as a metaphor for embattled queer identity and the path to self-actualization. For this exhibition, Alex uh, produced, well, produced, commissioned, wait, it's, it's murky, um, uh, several new works, <laughs> uh, including this stained glass window, uh, chain link curtains, and oversized witch hat, inspired by a variety of sources, including the Disney films Fantasia and Beauty and the Beast, and the horror films of Italian directors Dario Argento and Lamberta Baba, who are two people that we've bonded over immensely. Uh, this conflation of disparate sources further underscores the discursive and unstable nature of Alex's work. In these films, fantasy, magic, and the supernatural play significant roles in existential battles between good and evil. The rose, an enduring symbol of beauty and a recurring motif in, in Alex's work, makes an appearance here as a central element of the stained glass window. The image was appropriate from the opening sequence of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. The rose is a signpost for territory less traveled, the outer limits of artistic beauty, which is where Alex's work falls alongside that of some of his post-pop godfathers, such as the LA artists Mike Kelly and Paul McCarthy, whose work has privileged objection, dark comedy, the grotesque, and failure, which are radical positions to stake out in a world obsessed with beauty. Magic and illusion are also central to Alex's work and are themselves um, 
in the service of resistance. As Arthur Evans observed in his book, Witchcraft and Gay Counterculture, A Radical View of Western Civilization, <coughs> and some of the people it has tried to destroy, uh, quote, by tapping into magic, we are in the league with the memories of the forest and our own forgotten fairy selves now banished to the underworld. Let us invoke our friends, the banished and forbidden spirits of nature and self, as well as the ghosts of Indian, wise woman, black sor sorcerer, and witch, they will hear our deepest call and come. Through us, the spirits will speak again. A genuine counterculture that affirms the magic of human life is an ominous threat to the entire industrial order. My last exhibition at the Hammer before assuming my post at the ICA was a project with Simone Lee. Simone works in ceramics, sculpture, video, installation, and now social practice. She, examined, uh, she examines in her work the construction of black female subjectivity and economies of preservation and exchange. Her work, while largely research-based, considers a range of sources including ethnography, feminist discourse, folklore, and the histories of political resistance. Lee's sculpture, sculptural works in ceramics and other materials reference vernacular visual traditions from the Caribbean, the American South, and the African continent as well as the black diasporic experience dating from the middle passage to the present. Architecture for Simone is another extension of the body. Her covered sculptures, um, this one was the sixth version in a series, are steel lattice constructions, which are, that become armatures for other layers of covering or are left bare. Uh, when talking about this exhibition, we talked about maybe layering chain mail on top of the structure, but that was soon scrapped because it was both cost prohibitive and completely insane. But eventually, <laughs> I'm sure that we will real she will realize that. Uh, these womb-like structures allude to sub-Saharan African grass huts and rural meeting places which are often built by women. This sculpture is also inspired by a restaurant in Natchez, Mississippi called the Mammy's Cupboard which is housed with inside of a hoop skirt worn by a smiling, kerchief-wearing, crudely painted black woman. A mammy is an egregious stereotype uh, representing black womanhood with roots in the antebellum American South, which is usually characterized as a maternal figure responsible for the care of her boss's white children. Lee's recuperation of this reference and her appropriation of a particular form of vernacular architecture suggests another way in which bodies, particularly black bodies, inhabit space, both cultural and physical. Her sculptures, as well as her recent social practice um, performances, lectures, such as the Free People's Medical Clinic, The Waiting Room, and Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter, locate experiential activities geared towards community of color, communities of color within museums and art galleries, which are sometimes viewed as elitist by the general public. The projects make space for others within the culturally charged space of the institution. She is inspired by the outreach work of the Black Panther Party, which focused on illiteracy, poverty, and hunger, feminist consciousness raising, and radical self-care initiatives. These projects that take, all of these projects take a holistic approach to self-preservation, thus preserving people and culture. Now onto the present. This is kind of a top secret thing, but I'm just gonna <laughs> show it to you anyway. Um, the Institute of Contemporary at Los Angeles, or the ICALA, or the former Santa Monica Museum is opening in September of this year. Um, I've been at this post since August as the museum's first staff curator and the sole curator on staff, and it's been a very busy few months. The museum will be on 7th Street downtown across from the Greyhound Station and adjacent to the Arts District, and no, it won't be entirely yellow like this. This was just a test run. <laughs> So I'm gonna run a little bit through the history of the Santa Monica Museum, which, um, well, the Santa Monica slash ICA, I have to be careful how and when I refer to it as one or the other. But um, when I was a student of art history, um, I often read about the exhibitions that they were doing in Santa Monica and was completely inspired by it. So it's like a nice turn of fortune that I'm now working at this institution. Um, what makes this museum especially exciting to a person like me is its history of rigor and integrity and its support of artists and experimentation. It has supported a number of now influential artists earlier in their careers, which 2012 sounds crazy to say earlier, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. And also their final works. 
It has supported a number of artists uh, from diverse backgrounds and practices before it was necessarily fashionable. This is Lauren Popel's Art After White People, and that's Donald Rumsfeld right there. There has been a spirit of playfulness, but also a serious commitment to important questions that artists pose in their work. Institutional critique is second nature at this museum, not just a way of producing work. Acquainting myself with the museum's staggering 30-year history of exhibitions, programs, and educational initiatives were all the more reason why I felt this institution was one that I would be happy to align myself with. And yes, this is the Carrie James Marshall everyone's been Instagramming from his show at the Met, which is coming to MoCA very soon. Since August, I've been hard at work in concert with my colleagues to devise a curatorial program that is in keeping with the museum's rich history, but will also usher in a new era as we've transformed as an institution and with a new context and location comes new questions and issues. One thing I try to keep in mind as a curator is not getting in the way of this exchange between artists and the viewing public. To quote Adrian Piper, who the museum showed in 1991, and I think is still the only American institution that's done a solo presentation at Piper as of yet. Um, quote, one of the reasons for making and, and exhibiting art is to, reduce, to induce a reaction or change in the viewer. In this sense, the work as such is non-existent except when it functions as a medium of change between the artist and the viewer. As such, the work of organizing exhibitions, and now it's me speaking again, um, as such, the work of organizing exhibitions of works by artists is futile without the activation of the public, be it in providing different ways of looking or thinking about the world or inspiring them to do something large or small. In conclusion, I'm just going to give you a sneak preview of what we have coming up at the ICA. Uh, none of this is public yet, so keep it to yourselves. Just kidding, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> and this is strictly shows that I'm working on managing or co-organizing. Um, one of the inaugural exhibitions will be a presentation of 50 drawings by self-taught artist Martin Ramirez, organized by our director, Elsa Longhauser. Martin Ramirez, his pictures, his life in pictures, another interpretation will be the first monographic presentation of Martin Ramirez's work in Southern California, where he created this entire body of work. And it's the first to explore Ramirez's experience as a Mexican migrant laborer during the Great Depression. Ramirez was diagnosed with schizophrenia in the 1930s and confined to a California state hospital for three decades. The exhibition, organized on the occasion of the Getty Pacific Standard Time, will feature approximately 50 works and focused on the artist's iconography and mark making, his formal connections to mainstream modern art, and the significance of his cultural identity as a Mexican American. It'll also present, for the first time, a 17 foot scroll that comprises a lexicon of the artist's imagery and a complete visual narrative of his journey from Mexico to California. Project Room Abigail DeVille, uh, which I'm organizing, is the first solo project, the, so, the first solo Los Angeles presentation of the Bronx-based multidisciplinary artist, known for installations and sculptures found, made from found materials and personal effects that address displacement and historical instances of cultural erasure. Her complex, immersive installations also allude to the production and experience of physical space, particularly for women and people of color. Other project exhibitions include a temporary site-specific work on Our Outdoor Terrace by LA painter Sarah Kane. Uh, Rafa Esparza will be doing a project with him after his um, participation in the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Rafa is known for durational performance and sculpture that consider the impact of migration, colonization, and collective histories on the formation of identity and communities. This will be his first solo museum presentation. The Copenhagen-based uh, Pakistani artist Mariam Joffrey, who works across many disciplines, uh, will be presenting her project Product Recall, um, which is about discontinued, uh, dis discontinued commercial products uh, and kind of um, documentation about why they went out of circulation. It's a very funny and interesting project. And also the New York-based photographer Lucas Blaylock who exploits the gray area between documentary image and highly constructive photography using both analog and digital means. Later exhibitions uh, include a survey of the sculptor B. Wirtz and tentatively titled This Has No Name, B. Wirtz, 1980, 
um, to the present. This will be B. Wurtz's first major solo, well, not major, first solo museum exhibition in the United States, even though he does have um, a survey that is on view right now at La Casa Encendida in Madrid. Uh, this will be a different show. Wurtz has been working in assemblage and sculpture since the 1970s. Uh, his work revolves around the use of objects <coughs> that refer directly or indirectly to the acts of eating, sleeping, and keeping warm. Uh, his work often incorporates food tins, socks, clothes hangers, plastic bags, buttons, supermarket leaflets, plastic containers like yogurt cups, so on and so forth. Really beautiful and elegant stuff. He repurposes commonplace disposable household materials to craft his delicate sculptures and installations. By turning discarded material into works of art, he gives new meaning to lowly objects and demonstrates his commitment to the ethics of reuse. I'm also going to be co-presenting with the California African American Museum, the exhibition Royal Flush, uh, which will be Nina Chanel Abney's first solo museum exhibition. It's organized by Marshall Price at the Nasher Museum at Duke University. Described by the artist as easy to swallow, hard to digest, her works are, Nina Chanel Abney's works are densely packed with colorful figures, shapes, numbers, and strings of words evoking a sensory overload. Her large format paintings are playful and seductive in nature, though they are filled with narratives touching upon politics, race, homophobia, celebrity, consumerism, and other potentially incendiary topics. Nail and Blake, uh, who will be speaking here in a few weeks, and I are working on an exhibition of his work for fall 2019. Uh, Nail is a giant for me, so it is a, a deep pleasure that I get to work with him on a show. He has not had a major solo museum exhibition in California, though he has shown extensively internationally, and he'll tell you all about it in a couple of weeks. Interracial desire, same-sex love, and racial and sexual bigotry are recurrent themes in his work. Uh, which reflect his preoccupation with his own racial and sexual identities. In his first solo show at Matthew Marks, he exhibited eight sculptures that expanded on an earlier body of work, dealing with role playing, the skin's role in race and personal identity, and the concept of passing in terms of identity. And this is something that he returns to time and again. And then there's also this that's in research, and I'm not, you know, chicken to talk about my research that isn't quite formed yet, but um, I'm working on an exhibition that's been at the back of my mind because painting is never dead, it just changes shape. Uh, it's called, well, here's another, this is like the 20th title I've gone through, but this one is The Living End, Painting and Other Technologies, 1970 to the Present. That's pretty juicy, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the exhibition tra seeks to trace the lineage of artists working at the intersection of painting and technology, particularly screen and lens-based practices such as film, video, and photography. The exhibition wants to consider the ways in which painting has evolved to its current status as a fine art representational technology the ways in which its production has changed from handmade to computer made, and how the production of knowledge around painting as a field, a mode of expression, a cultural force, and an original symbol of genius has changed. The exhibition's line of inquiry is inspired in part by Jill, Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe's um, 1996 essay, Cabbages, Raspberries, and Videos, Thin Brightness, Painting in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, which posits early on a move in painting from objecthood to the immaterial, and the ways in which digital and video technology could be a lens through which to consider this time-worn practice. Work in the exhibition will fall into a couple of different categories. Painting made by hand, which references digital media and information technologies. Paintings done by machines, where the artist's hand is absent on the canvas, but rather in the setting up of a machine to do the work. The digital representation of painting, either through gesture or through depicting the process of painting on camera. And yeah, and it often calls into question the artist and genius paradigm, sometimes to humorous effect, such as Paul McCarthy's 1995 painter, video painter, which I hope to include. So 48 minutes later, uh, we're back to the original question uh, of curating, what is it good for? And don't, don't complete that. Um, in terms of my own practice, I find that it's particularly useful for starting a conversation and having an audience listen. The visual is a form of communication which is often subsumed by the spoken or written, but is just as powerful nonetheless. It provides opportunities for those who work exhaustively to articulate their point of view and need support in doing so. 
it opens up a dialogue between an artist and the public, which is often an illuminating one or a frustrating one, both of which are valid and important to growth and understanding. And it addresses <coughs> disparities and oversights both directly um, through advocating for certain artists, redressing through exhibition making the inconsistencies and erasures of the art historical canon, and indirectly platforming the politics of said artists for broader audiences. And it's also just another tool in the arsenal of strategies we the people can employ in order to make our voices heard and shake foundations. Thanks. Thank you.